biggest news federally um, is the beginning of the primary season for the presidential uh, candidates for 2016. And our first, uh, very first one is Iowa. They get the, they've always had, I think, uh, Mr. Van Buren, is that correct? They've, right. they've always been number one. So, um, so we're going to do a little bit of a recap. I've invited a fellow on here um, that is uh, going to kind of give us a, a recap of what the results were, what's coming down the pike. But, you know, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, you know, why am I calling you about this? Well, good morning, Monteagle, first of all, and uh, sure, glad and very honored to uh, to be on the show, so thank you so much. I uh, wish I could be there in person. Uh, like I told you, uh, I, I, you know, thanks to Al Gore's Internet, I'm actually checked in on Facebook uh, that I'm actually there, and uh, let's just pretend that I had breakfast at the Mountain Goat Market, and uh, now I'm having a cup of coffee with you. <laughs> Love it. All right, well, tell us about yourself. My name is Dennis Berwin, and uh, I currently live in Raleigh, North Carolina, but I have some very, very strong ties to the lovely state of Tennessee. I lived in Memphis uh, for a number of years in the late 80s, and again, uh, for some time in the late 90s. I went to college at the University of Memphis, which was Memphis State back then. I've uh, been involved in politics in Tennessee all that time and since actually was uh i was actually uh senator bill frist's first webmaster uh we created a website for him for his first re-election campaign uh, his only re-election campaign uh way back and uh, he was actually the first sitting senator who had a, uh, a re-election website that's how far back into the internets we go i uh, had the opportunity to work for senator frist in washington dc uh, when he was chairman of the National Republican Senatorial Committee. And uh, I'm uh, good friends and uh, a college uh, buddy with your Secretary of State, uh, Mr. Trey Hardnett, as well as uh, still have relationships with uh, Senate Majority Leader Mark Norris and a whole host of other uh, Tennessee politicos. So um, I try and stay tuned in to what's going on in Tennessee while taking a look at the, the political landscape all over our wonderful country. All right, and for North Carolina, we call you a research analyst, don't we? Yes, uh, one of my current gigs is to is working in the legislature here in North Carolina. We are actually in some ways trying to emulate the wonderful slide Tennessee took into making it one of the more conservative bastions of our country. And most importantly, what I like to talk about is good governance. And that is, how does the government, which must exist, how does it do the best job it can for the citizens while taking the least amount possible from those citizens? And uh, we're, uh, we're, you know, we're, we're working real hard here to turn North Carolina into as red a state as, uh, as Tennessee is. Wow, that's some high praise. All right. So not so red state, let's just say Iowa is our first, uh, first stop on the presidential primary. They had a caucus. What in the hay is a caucus? Well, that was quite a brouhaha that happened up in, in, in Iowa on uh, Monday night, and uh, it was very interesting. Of course, the, the, the big news is the turnout, especially on the Republican side. What a caucus basically is, is the parties are running what in Tennessee is known as a presidential preference primary. Uh, caucus literally means that people go to various locations, uh, usually their precinct location where they would potentially vote on, a, on an election day, and they gather together in separate rooms, <laughs> uh, and uh, the Democrats uh, stand around and, or sit around, and then uh, people, uh, you know, the leaders of the precincts uh, ask people to state who they are most interested in as far as having a presidential candidate, and they divide the room up that way. Uh, and uh, the Republicans, it's similar, but not, not exactly the same. You, what you'll notice is that the totals that come out of those caucuses are reported quite differently. Um, the Democrats do a proportional thing, and the Republicans basically use a raw vote. The big news was the, the amount of people that turned out in Iowa on the Republican side. 
a uh, huge number, 180,000, I think, something like that, whereas the last uh, highest was 120,000. So a lot of people turned out on a cold February evening to, uh, to state their preferences on presidential candidates in both parties. Okay, all right. So um, different results. So you had that, but it was so close. It kind of didn't match the polls. What kind of, what is your opinion on what happened up in Iowa? That's a that's a that's an excellent question. People should really, really pay close attention to what they hear, and to source their information uh, very carefully. You know, uh, you and I shared some pre-polling information uh, last week before the caucus, and there was the cross tabs are always what's interesting, and maybe only political geeks like you and I uh, really can kind of get into that stuff, and the general public should just be wary as to what the mainstream media says and how they say it. Uh, the polling data that was there beforehand really did reflect uh, what people think and what they feel, um, but the differences in those caucuses, there really is an opportunity to try and persuade people and change their mind. Uh, so if you have, uh, you hear about Ted Cruz, for example, having a great ground game, what that means in Iowa is that when you get to that precinct caucus area, you have a Ted Cruz representative or several uh, giving speeches and cajoling people and uh, using the powers of persuasion to say, hey, I know you walked in here and you're getting ready to, uh, you know, support, uh, I don't know, Rick Santorum. But, you know, Ted Cruz, here's the reasons why you need to come over to the Ted Cruz camp, for example. And so polling is good when you're talking about what people say they think they might do and also the questions that are asked and how they're asked. People are more willing over the phone to say things, and then when they come in person to do something, they often do something different. So, okay, so the ground game means, you know, at the very last second before they get to the polls, you could change their mind. That's exactly right. And Iowa voters are known to be fickle anyway. Uh, that's what makes the whole caucus thing a little bit interesting for Iowa, although their predictive, the predictive ability is not that high. Uh, if you look at, uh, you know, for example, Huckabee won in 2012, and obviously we know he was not the eventual nominee. Um, but the interesting on the other side, uh, the interesting thing that I think is being overlooked um, by the media is Bernie Sanders. Yeah. To think, to think that fully 50 percent, exactly one half of Iowa Democrat voters would go there and consciously select a socialist, uh, albeit of the Democratic variety, um, to, as, as their presidential preference over the coronated, the pre-coronated queen, HRC, is really an amazing thing because, again, you're standing there with your neighbors. You're standing there with people that you know and that you see and that you work with and that you go to the coffee shops with. Uh, and, you know, the, again, the conventional wisdom in the media has always been that uh, Hillary Clinton is the nominee for the Democrats. And... Uh, for people to stand there and say, no, you know what, uh, this, this Bernie Sanders guy is my guy, that's, that's quite a phenomenon. And even though the mainstream media is now selling the tale that it's a victory for, for Hillary, uh, I see it a little differently, and I see it that it is an enormous statement, even maybe a tipping point in America, that that many people would stand up and say, you know, Capitalism is no longer the best way to go. Let's try socialism in America. And that, that scares me a little bit, um, but I'm not surprised anymore by anything that that side does. Well, and you can go on the flip side and say Trump's a reaction to the anti-government movement. That's very true. I think that uh, Donald Trump, and, I, and by the way, I've been studying him for a long time, going back to uh, University of Memphis, uh, in my MBA courses, I remember doing a, a research paper and presentation on the art of the deal. So I've been watching him and, and his progress in life for, for many, many years, and I'm not surprised by anything he does. Somehow he has tapped in to a undercurrent in this country 
that people are resistant to being told what to think, how to think, and if they disagree with what the the the, the academia says and that and the culture says that they are the ones who are bigots. Uh, and, and he's really tapped into that, and there are a lot of people that are willing to stand up and say enough of that is enough. Whether that translates into actual votes, I think Iowa taught us that, in fact, it does not. Um, the big surprise on that side is how well Marco Rubio did. Um, we talked about this. I think that, uh, you know, the, again, the mainstream media is now selling the story that Marco Rubio is the establishment candidate. Um, they, they wouldn't have said that six weeks ago, uh, but, but they have to have a storyline. And when you, when you hear and read the mainstream media reports of, about Iowa, you will notice that it's almost as if they were all reading off a script. When everybody starts saying the same thing, I say beware. Wow. Now, what, what's this coin toss thing? Well, when there's a, an actual tie, uh, and folks that follow sports a lot know about coin tosses, so uh, what, what I heard was that they were using a coin with Hillary's head on both sides. I mean, six out of six precincts had to break a tie because they're not allowed to end with a tie um, with a coin toss. And, uh, you know, some people said that's how the 2000 election ended up um, with, with President George W. Bush winning uh, more or less by a, by a coin toss of the Supreme Court. But, um, no, that's one of the methods that they use to settle, to settle ties. Okay. All right. That's kind of fun. So now we go into uh, New Hampshire. You know, what, what now? The Granite State, also a very interesting personality, uh, very small. Now, remember, we're talking about... Uh, a tiny state, relatively speaking. Iowa had has three million some odd folks. They had a 1.5 million turnout in, in 2012. Uh, so basically, half the population of the registered voters they had a 70 percent turnout. The Granite State is even more quirky, uh, New Hampshire, and the elements that are going on there is again it is an all white state. Uh, you know, 90 plus percent, so they don't have a lot of cultural diversity, if you will, and, and certainly not racial diversity in that state. Um, and they're also known to be very rebellious. Uh, you were talking about the anti-government um, sentiments that maybe Trump was, was, was bringing out in people. That should be an interesting dynamic to see if Granite Staters actually follow through with that and choose Trump uh, as their as their uh, as their nominee, as their preference, so to speak. Okay, so we got New Hampshire, then we start moving into the South. How's that? I mean, we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of cruise supporters down here in the in the Bible Belt. How's that all going to hit with uh, with the elections? It'll be very interesting. And, and Tennessee, my my Tennessee friends, uh, please, please, please be involved. Stay tuned. Uh, March one is your big day on your presidential primary, uh, preference primary, and, uh, and you should really participate. Uh, you really, really should. This is your chance to be heard, and yes, uh, Senator Ted Cruz definitely has some momentum going in regards to the evangelical votes. Uh, he, he says it, he wears it proudly. In, in some way, I think those of us who are Christians admire someone who's willing to stand up and, and be as vocal as as he is in regards to his, his faith, I think it can well be argued that one of our challenges in our country is that we've lost a moral compass. That doesn't require necessarily a Christian faith, although that the Judeo-Christian principles are, in fact, what I believe have made our country so great. Um, I think March 1 is a time for, there's so many states involved on that day, and uh, one for Tennessee to really speak loudly uh, and, and, you know, those, those 9, uh, 11 electoral votes that you guys get to throw in, because this is all building up to the convention, uh, this, is your, this is your opportunity, and your, your neighbors to the south, Georgia, and to the west, Arkansas, are also playing on that day. So we strongly encourage you to get out, participate, be involved on both sides of the aisle, by the way. When do you, uh, when do you see this, when do you see us getting a nominee? Ah, that's, if I had the answer to that question, I, I'd probably be making a lot more money than I'm making <laughs> right now. 
I would guess um, by the time Florida rolls around, which is uh, March 15, I believe, North Carolina, we're playing on the 15th, on the Ides of March as well, we should have a lot better feel at that point. Um, there should be a number of nominees that drop out by then. Uh, personally, I think uh, Bernie and Hillary are going to go head-to-head to the very, very bitter end, uh, and their convention process may very well reflect that there is serious division in that party. The, the far left in that party has, has really gained strength and momentum, uh, and it may force Hillary to continue to attack to the left, which, of course, makes her so much more vulnerable in the general election when she's on record as supporting universal health care, et cetera, et cetera, that are things that, you know, that the far left really wants to see in this country. They want to see that kind of dynamic, huge change. Um, on the Republican side, I think by late March we'll have a, a much clearer picture. We, we probably will be down to one or two. Um, and, of course, we won't have an official nominee until the convention in Cleveland, which happens later in the summer. Okay, so after, you say, March, people will start vying for that VP slot. Is that when they start, you know, maneuvering? I love, I love this part of the conversation, my friend. Uh, I really do because it, it, uh, it, tells us some, it tells us all something about the candidate that uh, we didn't know before. Uh, and who they pick and why they pick them, that's always been a great speculation. Heck, I'd love to come back on sometime and talk just about that. It's, it's that important um, because it really gives us insight into the kind of people that the nominee wants to have around them. The one thing I will say about the Republican field, regardless of who comes out on top, there is a great bunch of choices for cabinet picks as well as a VP pick. Um, generally speaking, people have chosen VPs based on possibly geography or picking off a state that they might not otherwise win. Uh, or in, in the case of, for example, uh, Sarah Palin, to tap into an undercurrent that's going on um, in, in the country to attract uh, women voters or a particular demographic uh, that's interesting. So, uh, and, and, you know, I got to tell you, I was a Scott Walker guy for president before uh, Governor Walker got out, and I really like him. And I will say that he got out well before a lot of the dirt started flying around. So he's a, he would be a clean pick that would uh, possibly bring Wisconsin into the red fold on Election Day. So there's a, a number of reasons why he would be a very attractive pick. Well, then in that, on that same note, you've got a Kasich. You know, he's been very popular, on, surprisingly so, um, among people. I'm like, well, who is he? He has, and uh, he's, he's the kind of guy I can like. I'm also a Mitch Daniels fan, by the way. Earlier I mentioned about good governance, and I really do believe that good government, government policies – really lifts the citizens of, of a state. And I'd like to look at it on the state because I'm not a big fan of a big federal government. I'm a much bigger fan of states uh, exerting their own influences because they can understand what the people in their state need and how they can best help them. Federal policies very, very rarely can, uh, I mean, you think about the size of our country, a policy that works in Florida might have zero relevance in Alaska, for example. So I think that... Uh, well, and that, and that trickled down, to see, right. that trickled down for us in Tennessee is, you know, what's good in Nashville is not always good for Monegle. That's very, very true. Um, but at least you have the ability to be in Nashville within a couple hours' drive and go and talk to your lawmakers and lobby them in person. And I've seen you down there. I know you go down there. And uh, when they see you coming, they pay attention and they listen. And, and that's another point to your viewers and listeners. Uh, don't hesitate to pick up the phone and call your state representative, call your state senator. They really do want to hear from you. Even if you don't have anything nice to say, they really want to hear from you, and you'll be surprised at the reaction that you might get. I don't want to run away from Governor Kasich because he does have some really good governance policies. Ohio is a challenging state to govern. 
uh, because of the Rust Belt and, and some of the things that have happened historically in Ohio. And he seems to have done a great job. He's got an incredibly high rating. And that's a state that if a eventual presidential nominee would to pick him as a vice presidential candidate, that's, that goes back to that maybe taking a state that you might not otherwise win. Right. I will say, to be fair, though, uh, Governor Kasich does have does make some statements that wouldn't go over well in Tennessee, as far as uh, his uh, you know social stances and 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 things like that. Um, he's not quite um, our brand, if I can say that, conservative uh, that we that we'd like to see in that position. And if it's if it's Donald Trump as the nominee. Um, there's a lot of talk about, you know, what would he last? I mean, the first time Congress vetoes something that he wants to have done, how's he going to react? And, and will he just pick up his marbles and go home? I mean, that's something that's been more than just whispered. Uh, and in that case, uh, you know, does a, does a vice president case that become president case? Right. Well, and then you also have the, you know, counterbalance of a Cruz or a Rubio, you know, obviously. So... Yeah, okay, it's going to get really interesting. Definitely when we get uh, closer around, love to have you back on. You always have a great insight on things, um, you know, and it is important. You know, here we go. This is 2016 elections, and uh, I think an educated voter is, is, a, is, a, is a good voter for America. I'd like to say one last thing, Absolutely. and that is, is young people. If you've got young listeners, if there are young people out there who are possibly disenchanted with the political process or feel like they don't know enough about it, Bernie Sanders in Iowa killed it with young people. Now, you know, the, 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 the punsters and the, and the pundits out there all talk about because he wants to offer free things to, to young people, and that's how he's getting them excited. I would say if you're a young person out there and, and wondering whether or not you should be involved and informed about politics, especially if you have conservative values and you understand that there is no free lunch, please get involved. Find your local party, find your local officials, and get involved in the process and go and vote. Amen. Amen, brother. All right, well, come back and visit. You stay uh, dry down there, you know. The all-new.